I'm standing in Manuel de Faya's house. This is his house in Granada and Andalusia in Spain. Today I'm going to be talking about why the piece Homenaje is important in the guitar world and the guitar repertoire. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Debussy's influence on Valia and also the influence of Igor Stravinsky and other composers that he met in Paris. So why is Homenaje so important to us guitarists? Well, possibly the most crucial thing to mention at the beginning is it's really the only work written by a non-guitarist composer of standing in the first half of the 20th century. And it was written by a composer whose music was embedded in the folk music and culture of Andalusia, and for whom the guitar was a crucial part of his compositional process. Valia's influences really started when he moved to Madrid and met Felipe Pedrel. And Felipe Pedrel got him very interested in Spanish culture, and in particular, music of Andalusia and flamenco. And he took a great interest in this music. And when he moved to Paris, he met up with Debussy, who was also very interested in what we call a kind of alambrism, a sort of romanticized version of Spain. In the early part of the 19th century, there was various literature and so on, which kind of had this whole concept of the kind of last moors in Spain and Granada being the place as the sort of final refuge of the Arabic culture on the Spanish mainland. So in his early works, Falia already begin, began to incorporate the guitar into his writing. We can see in the second Spanish dance from La Vida Breve, uh, where his harmonies are kind of based on the kind of things that you get with flamenco guitar playing, where you might have a chord shape that moves up a semitone, but you keep some of the open strings so you get this sort of clashing. And it was this relationship of the semitone that kind of dominated a lot of Falia's writing. After the influence of Debussy, he got very interested in the modernism of Stravinsky. And the piece that really changed his outlook was the Rite of Spring. And in particular, uh, the chord overlay in the Overs of Spring, the famous rhythmic chord, uh, which you can hear in this extract. And it was a superimposition of an F flat chord with an E flat chord, two chords a semitone apart, and the kind of driving rhythms of this section that really set Valier off into his mature period. And we can see that El Amo Brujo is full of this kind of writing. So the guitar is kind of at the center of all his orchestral writing at this stage. In 1919, he wrote a large scale piece for piano, the Fantasia Betica, which is based a lot on flamenco patterns, rhythms, and so on. He owned a lot of books of flamenco music and about guitar in general, all of them annotated, and spent a long time looking at the way in which the guitar worked and how the fingerings worked and so on. And we can see in this piano work written just one year before the homenaje, the influence of flamenco guitar writing on his piano writing. This is a part of the miracle of the archive, uh, everything Manuel de Falla kept. He was a person that kept every little sketch. And we have so many sketches about anything. For instance, we have the article of Claude de Vici Lespan. We have all these uh, sketches about this article, but as well, uh, we have about Ravel or about Beethoven or even the letters he wrote to Claude Debussy. So this is really incredible. We can find everything kept. So this is the room where Falia did his compositional work. This is the desk where he wrote his scores and made all his meticulous notes and wrote his various letters to all the musicians he collaborated with all over Spain and the rest of Europe. Elena, hello. Manuel Falla pasó unos de los años más felices de su vida aquí en Granada, ¿no? Sí, eso dicen que fueron los 20 años más plenos de su vida. Él vino a Granada en el 19 y se fue a Argentina en el 39. Homenaje was Falla's only guitar piece. He collaborated with Miguel Libet over the piece and actually promised to write Libet two more solo pieces. These are the sketches for a guitar work he never finished. He promised to write two more works for Miguel Yvette, uh, but uh -huh. never had the time to do it. So this is the sketch for the unfinished piece. Let's turn now to the piece itself, Falia's Almanache. 
He really exploits the idiom of the guitar in this piece in a way that's very rare amongst non-guitarist composers. He really considered about the fingers, the open strings, and the positions of the notes. How do we know this? Well, we know this because he bought a lot of books about guitar playing, both classical and flamenco, and took a great deal of time to, this, to really study um, strings, fingerings, strumming techniques, and all the things that associated with guitar. This is one of my favorite artifacts. I've only seen this before in uh, Michael Christopher Reedus' mm -hmm. book. Now, when Felia was writing Homenache and when he was thinking about the guitar in general, he made these little sketches of guitar fretboards with the names of the notes. Now, if we look down here, if I can point with my finger, you may see that on the left-hand side, we have the string names. Yes. And then as we go to the right, we have the names of the notes on particular frets. So he was thinking about where the fingers were going to go for all the shapes he was going to use in Hamenache. So Falia's Hamenache is not just a piece for guitar, it's a piece about the guitar. With his use of open strings, but also with the very distinctive flamenco relationship between semitone that you hear so much in Cante Hondo. And on the guitar, that was manifest itself with an F falling to an E. So the piece is really just based on these two ideas, open strings and a semitone. He also uses it as a very poignant moment towards the end of the piece, after the quote from Debussy, where we return back into Falia's sound world, and we hear a chord not of F major, but a chord of F, A, C sharp, the augmented triad, so it's very, very ambiguous. Also, the way he writes the piece, sometimes it's difficult to know, you know, is the tonic note A, is the tonic note E? And it's only at the very end we sort of finally get the resolution and we realize that E is, is the home note where it's dying away. One of the most crucial things about this piece and the way it's interpreted by guitarists is that it's often referred to as homenage le tombeau de Claude Debussy. Of course, the piece first appeared in an edition of La Revue Musicale that was published in November 1920 to commemorate the life and work of Claude Debussy. There were various different tribute uh, articles from all around Europe Many musicians wrote about him. But there was also a musical supplement where various composers, including Stravinsky, Valia himself, were commissioned to write a new piece to commemorate Debussy's life and work. Now, it's the collection that's called Le Tombe de Claude Debussy, not the piece. The piece is not Homenage Le Tombe de Claude Debussy, it's Homenage à Guitar or Homenage à Claude Debussy. The fact that Valia uses an abaniera is very interesting because the abanera was a kind of nostalgic um, dance. The dance that originated in Cuba came over to uh, Spain and became kind of really integral into this kind of um, uh, reimagining of ancient Spain. Debussy's habaneras went at a kind of speed which roughly equivalent to the metronome mark we see in Falia's score. So that's quarter note equals 60. And when you listen to recordings of Suarez and Granad and Puerto del Vino, this is the kind of tempo the habanera is going at. It's a dance. It has to have this dance feel. It's not an elegy. It's not um, something which can be drawn out with so much rubato that you completely lose the sense of the dance. Let's listen to the beginning of a recording of this piece by Narciso Yepef. And this kind of typifies a very romantic approach to the piece, something that plays on the alambrism and the impressionism that we might see in the works of Albaniath or Debussy.
Let me play you now an extract from a performance by Ken Murray. And this focuses much more on the modernist aspects of Fallier's thinking at this time. More open strings, harder sound, more rhythmic, and much closer to the written tempo of quarter note equals 60. It has a kind of austere modernist quality about it that doesn't have any of the kind of dreamy uh, romanticism of the previous recording. So in a way there, we have the two extremes of interpretation of this piece. And of course, most other interpretations come on a kind of continuum between the two. I now want to say a little something about the place of Omenache in the guitar's repertoire. The unusual thing about the piece is that it was written by a major composer of huge international standing at the height of his powers, but a composer who did not play the guitar. And it really still stands alone as the only piece in the whole of the first half of the 20th century that was written by a well-known composer who didn't play the instrument. In 1920, Fallier's fame was worldwide. He'd had huge successes with ballets, operas, and he was mentioned in the same breath as composers like Bartok, Stravinsky, and Debussy. So it's an incredibly important work for us guitarists, and one that I think every guitarist at some point will play. You can read a lot about the piece, you can look at all the archives or the manuscripts and so on, read everything that everyone's written about the piece, but the beauty of it is no one's ever going to find the perfect way to play it, because there's so much ambiguity in the piece, despite Falia's incredibly meticulous markings. One of the things that's really wonderful about looking at the manuscript is you can see all the detail that's written in. Almost every single note either has a dynamic or an articulation mark. His ideas were incredibly clear. So whatever tempo you decide to play the piece, however much rubato you decide to put into the piece, the thing I think that's really the real takeaway from the score are um, articulation marks and the dynamic marks that are so carefully put in. In terms of rubato, Fallio's piece still is very much part of that kind of impressionistic area. It's not a kind of rhythmic piece that has to be played in time all the way through. Absolutely not. But there's a kind of range of expression that's possible. More with time than with colour or positions of fingers and so on. So in a, in a sense, the expressiveness in the piece comes from this incredibly controlled rubato rather than trying to make a whole load of localized, vivid colors. <laughs> 